Well, good morning. Awesome to see you guys. Uh, today, my sermon is influenced by men and women like Eidelman, Stanley, Rochelle, and Sandberg. We're going to be traveling. Well, you know, Chris Stanley's in this part, too, but yeah. Andy Stanley. Thanks. Is this how it's going to be all day? All right. It's all right. So we're going to be traveling to uh, 1 Kings 17, and we're going to take a look at the life of a man named Elijah. Now, when Elijah was alive, the northern kingdom had experienced 19 consecutive evil kings, spanning a 200-year time period. Now, let's just let that sink in, just for a moment. Imagine, if you will, not just 19 ineffective leaders, but imagine 19 consecutive evil leaders. And in the time that Elijah lived, there was a very evil king named Ahab, who was married to a wicked woman named Jezebel. Some say the most wicked woman who had ever lived. And under their reign, the Bible says that Ahab and Jezebel did more evil in the eyes of God than any of those other 19 evil kings before them. So this is a very dark time in which Elijah is living. We're talking about major scandals, tremendous idol worship, and God said, enough is enough. But God didn't raise up an army to take a stand against the evil king. Instead, God does what God often does, and that is he raised up one person to take a stand. And I would argue that in today's world, God may want to do something very similar with you. God may raise up one person to take a stand against sexual impurity. God may raise up one person to take a stand in integrity in a business that's lacking it. God may raise up one person to go into politics to take a stand for that which is true. God often raises up one person to make a big difference. So today, to build a foundational understanding of who Elijah is, I want to look at his name. The name Elijah comes from three root words, L, I, and J. L stands for Elohim, or God, and I is the personal pronoun for my or mine, and J comes from Jehovah. And so put together, if you're taking notes, very literally, the name alone, Elijah, means God, my Jehovah, or the Lord is my God. And so immediately, when, when God raises up this prophet to stand up to Ahab, by his very name alone, he's making the testimony, the Lord God is the one true God, my God is Jehovah. So let's pick up the story. The very first time we see Elijah in all of Scripture is in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, he's talking to the king, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, if this was a movie, the music would get really intense right here. Because what was just said was one of the most strategic prophetic judgments against the land that you could imagine. He said, for the next months and even years, there will be no rain and no dew until you come back to the one true God. This would have been an economic shutdown in this day where everything was ran by agriculture. No rain would shut their entire system down. Today, if this were to happen, it would mean no access to gas at gas stations. The banks wouldn't be lending money. You wouldn't be able to get your money out of the bank. You wouldn't have electricity. Grocery stores would sell out in an instant. There would be people just starving death all around you. Life as you knew it would have just ended. So this prophet stands up to this evil king and says, no more rain. It takes tremendous faith to do something like that. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's time for a fight. But instead, God does something very different. God takes Elijah into a season of hiding. 
God takes Elijah away. And we are going to watch as God shapes this man in a very deep season of preparation. Why does God do this? God is saying to Elijah, there's so much more I need to do in you because there's so much more I want to do through you. Many of you will identify with the three seasons of preparation that God takes Elijah through. Number one, God prepares Elijah through a season of isolated pain. Elijah's all alone. He's hurting very privately in a season of hiding. Verse 1, he says, no more rain. Verse 2, then immediately after that, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of Jordan. Can I get all of you guys to say the Kareth Ravine? Come on. Come on, say it again. Yes. Now, in this word in Hebrew, kareth, it means to be cut off from the source, to be cut off from the blessings, or very literally, it means to be cut down like you would chop down a tree. And you can see what God is doing. God is saying, I'm going to take you through a season of breaking. And everyone got really excited, right? Love to be broken. Thank you, God. Yeah. I'm going to cut you down. I'm going to teach you to be totally dependent on me. And I'm going to humble you privately before I can use you publicly. I'm going to do something in you that's very, very deep. So later on, you can do more than you ever thought was possible. I'm going to humble you privately before I can use you publicly. A lot of times, people are in the Kareth Ravine. They're in a season of pain. They're going, where is God in this? And the reality is, God is right there doing a deep work in you. A.W. Tozer wrote, he wrote this, It is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Nikki and I have been through a season of isolated pain. Ten years ago, we found out that we couldn't have kids without medical help. We were youth pastors at the time, and this was a very rough time for us. Every Mother's Day, every Father's Day, every baby shower, every kid's birthday party, whenever our friends announced that they were pregnant, we got a little more sad and hurt towards our situation. I remember one of our youth students came to us and said, My boyfriend and I only had sex once and we're pregnant. What should we do? As her youth pastors, we counseled her and we gave her godly advice, yet some resentment, if I'm honest, towards God started to creep in. One time God is all it took for them. We've been trying for years. Frustration, hurt, confusion. Some of you right now, you would say, Pastor Kermit, I'm living in the Kareth Ravine. Maybe it's a family situation, finances, bad news from the doctor, you just lost your house, you're there. You're being broken, you're being cut down physically, emotionally, spiritually. And God is saying to you, I'm doing something in you. There's a preparation going on. I'm doing this work in you now so I can do more through you later. Number two, God prepares Elijah through a season of total dependence. Verses four, five, and six says this. God says, Elijah, you will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So here we see Elijah's all by himself, and God does this miracle, right? In the middle of a drought, there's no water, and God provides this brook. Water comes up out of the ground, and Elijah drinks from it. Okay? And then we've got God's heavenly catering service going on, right? These birds 
crazy story. These birds go out and find food, and every morning and every evening they deliver the food straight to the prophet. What was God doing here? God was very clearly saying that no matter what and for always, I will be faithful. You can count on me to provide for you. So during this time of hurt, pain, and frustration that Nikki and I were walking through, even though we didn't understand it and how it seemed totally unfair, we still depended on God. I don't know what it is about the I word, but I had never heard it talked about as a kid, as a teenager, or even as an adult in my 20s and 30s. I mean, obviously, people have struggled with it before, yet I had never heard anyone ever open up about their journey of infertility. So through this season of totally depending on God, God told us to open up to some a couple in our lives. And I'll tell you what, guys, I didn't want to open up about struggling with infertility. I'll just be honest. Like came up, rose up against my manhood or something. I don't know. I just didn't want to talk to people about our struggle with infertility. But God told us to open up to our, our friends, Paul and Debbie. And I'll never forget sitting in their living room telling them what was going on with us and how they prayed for us and hugged on us. And I remember Paul saying to me these words, keep depending on God. He has a purpose for your pain. Forever and always, God says, I will be your provider. When you can't depend on what you used to be able to depend on, I will deliver what you need. And here's the cool thing about Elijah in this situation. God didn't give him two days worth of food. God didn't give him a week's worth of food. God didn't give Elijah three months' supply. What did God give him? Enough for the day. Some of you may be in a season where you're hurting and you're alone and you're afraid, but guess what? God delivers enough for your day. You may be uncomfortable, but God says, I will be your comfort for today. You may not have much, but God says, I will be your provision for today. You may feel weak, but God says, I will be your strength for today. God says, I will bring you exactly what you need. I will be your daily bread. And Elijah learns to depend on God for that day. God is breaking him. He's cutting him down. He's humbling him. He's teaching Elijah Total dependence. Number three, God prepares Elijah through a season of unconditional obedience. Verses 7, 8, and 9. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. Now, let's put ourselves in the prophet's place. It's been months that he's been in this ravine and the brook, it's been feeding him water daily and God told him to go there and then the brook dries up and God says to move on. In my mind, I'm starting to think, okay, God, where are you? What's the purpose of being here? You gave me water from the brook. Now the water dries up. Did I do something wrong, God? Have you ever been there? You're telling me to leave this place of sanctuary. Did I miss you the first time, God? Am I hearing you, God? I don't quite understand. The brook dried up. Why would the source of what used to feed me dry up? Why would you take that away, God? And he's going to learn here that the same God who gives water can take water away. Because often, and please hear me, church family, please get this, God may cause the brook to dry up to give you the courage to leave where you are and go where you are supposed to be. God may cause the brook to dry up to give you the courage to leave where you are and go where you are supposed to be. God knows what he's doing, even when we don't understand In my opinion, life was pretty simple. I'm a simple guy, all right? Find the girl of my dreams, check. 
There she is right there. I bet. Get married. Check. Wait eight to ten years to get our feet under us. Have college done. Be working in our careers. Check. 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 Then we would start having kids. Really simple. We had our plans on what we wanted our family to look like, down to how many and their names. We were good to go. No check. That wasn't God's plan. We entered the Karith Ravine. We were in a season of pain, in a season of total dependence, in a season of unconditional obedience. So we're about three years into the drought that Elijah had promised. God calls him right to the Karith Ravine and then calls him to Zarephath of Sidon and then God calls him back to see King Ahab. Chapter 18, verse 18. And again, Elijah says, Ahab, you and your father's family have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. And Elijah was confronting a culture where they would worship multiple gods. Pastor Chris talked about idolatry a month ago. If you missed it, I encourage you to go online and listen to it. Now, I know and I understand that most people here today aren't worshiping the false god of Baal. If you are... Come talk to me later, okay? (laughs) But in reality, the false gods today that people worship and serve are much more socially acceptable, right? The false gods of money, material possessions, careers, hobbies, relationships. Now, when we elevate anything into the rightful place of the one true God and put anything on the throne of our life besides God, we, you and I, are committing idolatry. All right, so what does he do next? He tells the people that it's time for a showdown. Finally, right? Finally. God tells Elijah to go pick a fight. I can do that. I can go pick a fight. Verses 19 through 21. He says to King Ahab, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel, and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So what did he do? He has a showdown, and he says, get two bulls for me, one bull for you, one bull for me. We're going to build a couple of altars, and we're going to sacrifice them each to our own God. And you are going to call on your God, and I'm going to call on my God, and we'll really see who is God. And whichever God sends fire down from above and burns up that sacrifice, then that God is the one true God. And the people said, what you say is good, Elijah. And here's what they were thinking. Elijah, do you know who you're messing with? We are going to call on our God, Baal. Baal is the sun god. Sun is hot. It's fire. You're going to get smoked, Elijah, is what they were thinking. And so they go in on Elijah's deal. They took their bull. They prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal, the Bible says, from morning till noon. And they're dancing and they're shouting, but there was no response. No one answered them. And I love this about Elijah. He starts messing with them. Verse 27, you can read it in your Bible. It says, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Yeah. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping, and you need to shout louder so he can be awakened. And as Elijah's taunting them, they shouted louder and danced harder. So finally, at the end of the day, Elijah stepped forward, and he prayed. Okay, he didn't dance or shout or clamor to get God's attention. All Elijah did was... He prayed. He said this in verses 36 and 37. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God 
in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Can you see the power and the beauty in this prayer? O Lord, let it be known. Reveal yourself. Show us who you are. Let us see you. May we feel the heat of your love. Why? So that you may turn the hearts of these people back to you. So they will only worship you, the one true God. So Elijah prays, and then verse 38, watch what happens. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also lit up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell to the ground and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And that would be my prayer for us this morning, that we would see God for who he is, and that all the false gods would fall far away in comparison to the one true God, and our hearts would be turned back to him. You see, guys, God was made known that day to King Ahab and all the people of Israel. They turned to him as their one true God. Some of us here today have fallen away from putting God in his rightful place in our lives. Maybe he used to be first in your life, and something happened, And now God has been pushed down the list of things that are most important to you. Maybe God has never, never been in your life. And you want to ask him today to be Lord of your life. This morning, God may be saying to you, because I want to do more through you, I have to do more in you. Church, let's embrace the work that God wants to do in us. God may allow you to go through the Kareth Ravine So one day, you can be the catalyst, the fire starter, the faith developer in the life of someone else. I praise God for all the hurt and pain that I have experienced. All of the brokenness and all of his unconditional love. Because all of it has shaped me into the man, husband, and now father that God wanted me to be. Let's pray, God, I thank you for who you are and who we are in you. Help us, God, to to trust in you at all times, even in our pain, in our brokenness, even in our mess. God, help us to be totally dependent on you. I pray, God, that we would really know you. Help us, God, to, to daily put you first in our lives. Give us your strength and your power that we may live in your freedom. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today at Cornerstone Church. I want to officially invite you all back to our evening prayer service at 6 p.m. Have a great evening. You guys are all amazing. Love you.